Who's first? You first? I'm first. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I am Frank Rainwater. I am the Executive Director of the Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Office. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. It is my pleasure today to present to you the Education Funding Dashboard, which is an additional tool to provide transparency and accountability in the education funding system. We hope this tool makes education funding data and information more accessible to both policymakers and the public to further support informed decision making. Before we begin the demonstration, I would like to thank several individuals and groups who helped us get here today. First, I'd like to thank Governor McMaster, President Alexander and Speaker Smith, Chairman Peeler, and Chairman Bannister for having the trust and confidence in our office to handle this task. I also would like to thank state superintendents, both Ms. Spearman and Ms. Weaver for their support and assistance in providing the data and providing guidance in this matter. And then finally, I would like to thank our school superintendents and the school finance officers who, uh, who further assisted with data and other issues in providing this report. Let me say, please note, however, this is the first full release of the dashboard and the first opportunity that districts will have to actually look at comparisons of their data to the other districts. In other words, don't call the school superintendents yet and ask them why they're 17th or 20th on a particular ranking. They will need time to, to digest this. The dashboard highlights fiscal relationships in an easy to understand format, and we anticipate this will uncover additional needs for data reporting and analysis and we look forward to working with everyone and continuing to work on this task. In a few moments, Ms. Lisa Jolliffe from our staff is going to demonstrate the dashboard, the data, and the key features. And we have provided a summary sheet or have a summary sheet available to you to help guide you through this process. Before we begin, however, I'd like to make a few high-level observations. This is the initial release of uh, um, this is the initial release, and it focuses on data for the most recent school year, 21-22. Uh, and this is going to help to establish a baseline as we continue to go forward. Over time, we hope to further enhance this dashboard with more years and more data as data becomes available. The dashboard is focused on funding which is done at the district level and not the school level. At some point in the future, we hope to have the data in available to go down to a school level information, but right now what you're gonna see is district level data and comparisons. Um, and there's a couple of data issues I will point out as you look at this later. Uh, first, you will notice when you go into some of the analysis that Limestone um, Charter District did not exist in 22, so even though they're on the website, there's no data for there. And then second, we do have some expenditure data uh, uh, clarifications with the other charter school district. Uh, we know some of those data is overstated, but we're waiting on their input to correct that. And then finally, while we will highlight some key observations and interesting uh, points about this, the dashboard is designed for users to do their own research and do their own analysis and come to your own conclusion. So today is just another step in the journey to improve transparency in public education funding. And we hope this dashboard serves an additional resource to aid in that process. So at this time, let me introduce Ms. Lisa Jolla from our staff, and she is going to walk through you how to access in the, in the features in the dashboard. Thank you, appreciate it. I'm excited to get to walk everybody through how to operate the dashboard today. And you'll notice we have our landing page that's going to be on our website that will enable you to get through to the dashboard. The website address for the landing page is on the summary page we handed out to everyone. But in addition, we will also have a link to this that will be available on our home page shortly after the meeting today. So to just highlight a few things and some resources that are available on the website before we get into the dashboard itself. We have a number of resources here that are some of the things that I'm going to walk you through today, particularly a how-to guide, which illustrates some of the more advanced technical features in the website, just for reference for those who may want it. And then we also have a whole series of definitions and resources that are available to help you learn more about the sources of the data, more information about what's included in specific categories, 
If you expand on one of these, it'll give you a lot more information about the different subcategories. What's in expenditures, what constitutes instruction costs, what are in some of these other categories. And then we've also done the same for your revenue categories. What is your fund balance and how is that calculated? What's considered a teacher? How do we calculate the average teacher salary, student teacher ratio, and then more about the aid to classrooms funding program. I'll also highlight for you a couple of other resources that we have along the side here. We've got the Department of Education's website linked, a link to some other resources that may be of help. And then lastly, there is a contact information. If you have specific questions about a district, we would encourage you to reach out to that district. But if you need technical help or if something that you can't find here, we're happy to answer technical questions for you. And so there's an email address available for you there to reach out to. So from the top of the page, if you click on this button, it will take you to the dashboard itself. And as you can see here, we have the education funding dashboard. It lands on your funding page. And this summarizes the funding information for all of the school districts statewide. As you move across, you can see the bars here that show you the total statewide expenditures and revenues, as well as the expenditures and revenues per student. We've put everything on a per student basis as well that allows you to make um, comparisons across different districts of different sizes. And then through the middle of the dashboard, you can see the top pie chart separates out those expenditures by different categories. What was spent on instruction? And statewide, you can see 46% of the expenditures went towards instruction, another 11.3% went to instructional support, and so on through the other categories. And again, as I mentioned, if you have any questions about any of those categories, we have resources on that landing page, and there is a link up at the top that will allow you to hop back and forth. So if you want to get back to that landing page, you can use that link to go back to that landing page. Below, you'll see the pie chart that explains similarly the funding sources, where are the revenues coming from for the school districts. School districts received about 38% of their funding from local property taxes, another 32.8% from K-12 appropriations, and then you see the state property tax reimbursements and the funding from federal sources. And then along the side, we've highlighted a number of the key factors that affect school district finance and funding. The school district funding formula in the aid to classrooms that was just implemented has a large weighting on students in poverty. And so we've highlighted for you the statewide percentage there of 60.9% of students in poverty overall across all of the school districts. The average teacher salary in 21-22, which was $54,814. And then similarly, the expenditures and expenditures per student. And then lastly, we've highlighted fund balance. This shows you what the general fund fund balance is available to each school district, essentially what is their rainy day fund, and how does that compare to their total expenditures. School districts had about 15.2% of their expenditures available in their fund balance to cover any of their expenditures. And so as you can see, this is all of our statewide data. If you click on the map, and I'm gonna use Greenville as my example, Greenville's the largest school district in the state, it will show you specifically how that changes and how, the, how Greenville County works. And you see how this has changed. Greenville's revenues per student were $15,000 for that school year in 21-22. Their students in poverty were 60%, and you can see all of the other different elements specifically for the Greenville County School District. And then you can see here, you've got instructions in each of the blocks. If you click in the white space, it will reset you back to the statewide overall view. So we've provided a number of graphs here for you, but for those users who want to have more access to the data, each of these pages will have a data tables button. And you can click on that button down in the bottom corner, and it will bring up all of the background data that's used in the dashboard for anyone who wants more information or wants to do their own analysis. And we have a cheat sheet of instructions in the top corner to walk you through those steps so that you can use the navigation bar down below to click download and download the cross tabulations of the data, whichever the pieces you want. It also has the functionality to download PDFs or images from any of the pages as you're going through the website. So that functionality is available as well. So to navigate the dashboard, we have tabs across the top that will lead you to each of the different sections. When you start, you'll land on the funding page. And the next tab will show you more about quick facts. Quick Facts is a way for everyone to see very quickly information about a specific school district. So when you land on the page, you'll see the statewide values, but again, if we click on Greenville, you can see how Greenville compares in all of these categories to the statewide average. 
So we start there at the top with the information you've seen on the last page talking about the average teacher salary and how Greenville compares to the statewide average, their percentage of students in poverty at 60% versus the statewide 60.9. We also have added on this page, you see students per teacher. Greenville has 17.6 students per teacher compared to the state average of 16.2. And again, your revenues per student and expenditures per student. In the bottom corner, we've shown you how many students are in Greenville School District and how many classroom teachers they have. In the center, we've added another measure which shows you student assessments. What percentage of students met or exceeded expectations on English and math in the most recent, um, excuse me, in their report card data for 21? And then again, total revenues and total expenditures. And as I said, you can click on the data tables to get to this information for any of these pages. So then if you want to compare across multiple districts, the Compare Districts page will let you select a number of districts and be able to compare them to each other across 12 different categories that we've talked about as we've walked through the dashboard. So again, if we select Greenville, if you follow the instructions down here in the bottom corner of the map and you hold the control button on your keyboard, it will allow you to continue selecting districts and you can see how all of those districts compare to each other. And it is a lot of data, so give it a little minute to um, come up. Apologize, I think I unclicked my district. Sorry, everyone. So there we've got Greenville pulled up in Oconee, and you can see how they compare to each other. And if we add in Pickens, you can see it will continue to stack districts. And you can select which values you want to look at specifically. You can compare students by any of these measures that we've seen throughout the dashboard, what percentage are meeting or exceeding expectations in English and math, and when you click on that, it will populate through here and you'll see how all of those change. You can choose which ones you want for each of the different four comparisons and you can change your comparison order, you can change your sort order. You also have a table down here that shows you the rankings. So for English and math, Greenville ranks sixth highest in the state in terms of their percentage of students who are meeting expectations. And then you see Oconee at 26 and Pickens at 18th. So that just gives you another way to look at how student different districts compare and how they rank across these 12 different categories of expenditures and revenues and other particular measures. The next tab we're gonna talk about is our aid to classrooms. This is the new funding formula that was put in place in 22-23. And so you'll notice that this is budgeted data, so it is a year ahead of the information that we've been showing you. The most recent financials are 21-22, but on a budget basis, we're looking at 22-23 when we rolled out the new funding formula. And the way the funding formula works, every district is paid based upon an average teacher salary for a teacher with a master's plus 12 degrees of ex excuse me master's degree plus 12 years of experience and the statewide minimum salary schedule for that in 22-23 was $52,604 and you add in fringe benefits you see the total cost there of 69,153 and then the formula funds an average statewide student teacher ratio of 11.2 students per teacher in the funding formula and in this case, the funding formula is based upon instructional positions. This is slightly different some, from some of the other measures that you'll see when we're working through the dashboard. We typically refer to classroom teachers per student. The funding formula for aid to classrooms is based upon instructional positions. And there are notes here about what's included in instructional positions. In addition to teachers, you also have guidance, librarians, and other instructional support positions. And so the funding formula is based upon the student's needs and the funding formula at that average cost and the 11.2 ratio combined with a split of 75% state support and 25% local support. But just as a reminder, the public charter school districts receive 100% of their funding from the state. And so when you look at that, it actually works out to be that the state is providing 77% of support for the Aid to Classrooms program and the locals are providing the extra 23%. So if you again click on Greenville, you can see how that changes. Their district receives 78% of their support from the state, and they put up 22% of the support for the Aid to Classrooms program themselves. And again, everyone's funded at that same teacher salary, but they have funding for an 11.3 students per teacher based upon their wealth and their student needs. They actually funded, excuse me, actually employed 14.8. And you can see there the funded positions and the actual positions in all of those instructional categories. So the last page we're gonna talk about is a little bit more detailed. It goes into scatter plots. 
These scatter plots help you view the relationship between each of these different elements within the dashboard and help you look for relationships that may exist between these elements. Specifically, we have two static plots across the bottom. You see here the percentage of students that are meeting or exceeding expectations in English and math relative to the percentage of students in poverty along your bottom x-axis. And you can see the inverse relationship here that forms. The higher the percentage of students in poverty, the lower the average percentage you're seeing here of students who are meeting or exceeding those expectations. And so if you look at any of the districts, you can see which districts each of them are by hovering over the different little dots on your scatter plot. And for those of you who remember your statistics classes, you can look at the um, statistics behind this and look at that relationship. The other graph that we've shown here is um, on the other side is English and math um, achievement versus revenues per student. And you can see the difference here between these two graphs. You see a very strong relationship between students in poverty and student achievement, whereas with students in, um, excuse me, revenues per student, you don't see that strong relationship. You have a value here where a district has about $15,000 per student, and they are seeing over 60% of their kids meet or exceed expectations, versus another district down here that is only seeing about 20, less than 20% of their students meet or exceed those expectations. So this is an easy way for people to be able to see those relationships between the different elements in the dashboard. You can also choose different elements up here. We have it selected for you so you can see the relationship between student achievement and the number of students per teacher, which again is very widely dispersed. There's not a strong correlation there. And you can change to view any of the different ones that you wish to. And so again, as you're moving through the dashboard, you'll see all of these maps. And you can change the elements of the map to see all of the different dashboard elements as well. So those are all of the highlights. I appreciate the opportunity to walk everyone through this. Again, we have a lot of resources that are available for you there on our homepage and our landing page. And if we can be of any assistance with any technical questions, we're happy to help. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Pretty interesting, huh? <laughs> Everybody's going to go home and get all, or go somewhere and get on their computer, including me. Uh, we all know that <clears throat> the, the road to prosperity is paved with a good education. We, we've got to do it. Uh, there's no way around it, and we, we've recognized that, and we know we have some weak spots. Now, we are, we are booming in our economic growth. Our environmental and cultural heritage is strong, but if we don't have good educations for all the young people coming along and those older ones who want to go back, then we just, we're not going to achieve our full potential. So it's, it's good that we're doing this now because we're really starting to boom. And uh, there's, a, there's great competition among, particularly in the southeast, and these businesses that are here and those that want to come here that bring jobs with them, and a, a job income is critical to a strong family, but we, we have to have good people. They have to be educated, they have to be trained. And the, the other states, are, we realize this, but I think that, uh, I don't know of another one that's got something quite like this, and part of this is, is due to the strength of our Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Office, that they can do anything with statistics. <laughs> And they can make it make a, a picture. So that's what they've done here. This is a, this is a result of a lot of thinking. We've been doing a lot of improvement and a lot of years in education, and we still believe in strong public, strong private, strong any kind of school. One size never fits all, and we have to have available for our students of what they need to to succeed. And that's why we we went back last year and came up with a new education funding formula. That we, it's a certain amount of money goes to that district per student. You can see that on here and see this also, this will allow you to see how it is being spent. So we asked them when the legislature, when we all got together and determined that it, it was time to have a new, not so complicated formula so we could make some sense out of it. We realized that if you can't manage it if you can't measure it. So this is how we're measuring it right here. That's the result of, of that. So uh, this, is, this is a great step forward for our state. The, the other steps being taken, we got a lot more, but the, uh, the future is getting brighter and brighter. Ellen? Thank you, sir. 
Well, a common theme that you've heard from all of us today is about transparency. And I have said for a long time that the way that we build trust in public education is through total transparency. And so I just want to say thank you to RFA, to the General Assembly, and to the governor um, for their support of this incredible vision that I truly believe is going to help us move our education system in South Carolina forward. I believe that the most important job of any leader is to provide clarity and alignment. And that is something that our governor does for our state every single day in articulating a strong vision, the three E's, I think he calls it, of what we have to have in order for our state to be successful. And what tools like this do is allow us to then take that vision and translate it into action by understanding how we align resources to get there. I really see this whole project as one of ROI. Um, how are we illustrating to the public, to the General Assembly, and to our education stakeholders the return on investment that we're seeing for the massive amount of investment that we make as a state? I mean, $12 billion overall, um, almost 17000 average per pupil. I mean, those are significant investments, and, and we need to have robust transparency for how those precious taxpayer dollars are being spent. Um, and so this, this project and projects like this have been a passion of mine for a long time because what we're doing today here is making data meaningful. Um, data can exist in you know um, a spreadsheet somewhere and it is not doing anything to actually accomplish what I truly believe we all want to accomplish which is excellent education for all of our students and so this is going to be a meaningful way to help inform decision making to deliver return on investment. Um, as has already been referenced by the governor and our, our friends at RFA, our education finance form until recently was a very complex spider web that nobody could understand and I am so thankful to the General Assembly um, for their vision in helping us really simplify that funding formula and that enables us to now tie so many of these decisions that we're making to actual student outcomes because one thing that I've noticed in education writ large is that a lot of times there's a lot of activity but not a lot of that alignment that I talked about and it may be well-meaning activity but we know what works in order to deliver outcomes for students and I would just like to share over the last four weeks I've had the opportunity to be in four different title one schools in dramatically different communities across our state rural urban um, and across all different demographic populations but the common unifying theme of these schools is that they are absolutely knocking it out of the park we just released the state report cards a few weeks ago and these schools were all shining stars of success to celebrate and as we saw on the beautiful scatter plot here, there's not a correlation really between inputs and outputs when it comes to money and student outcomes. And that's something that our Title I schools that I have been in are proving every day. And you may ask, okay, well, if it's not money, what is the secret to success? It's strong principal leadership. I was able to be with some principals today to celebrate National Principals Month here in October. And what they do to set the culture in a school that recruits and retains great teachers is absolutely essential. You have to have high quality instructional material, which is something that the General Assembly continues to invest in and we're so grateful for their partnership. And then you have to have high quality professional development for your teachers in order to support that instructional material. And again, we've had tremendous partnership from the governor's office and from the General Assembly in um, rolling out what is something I'm very passionate about, letters, which is professional development around early literacy. If our students can read, they can do anything. One of my favorite things is to go read to elementary school students and to tell them that if they can read, they have a superpower, which is absolutely true. And so again, this is going to be such an important step forward in helping us explain to parents, um, to the public, to interested citizens, how their hard-earned dollars are being spent to deliver real results for our students. And I'd like to just close by saying that oftentimes it can be tempting to use data as a weapon instead of as a tool. And I want to stress that in the conversations that I have with educators all across the state, whether we're talking about a financial dashboard like this or whether we are talking about our state report cards, 
that this is a way for us to understand where we are so we know how to get to where we need to go. Um, I often think about the example of we all have phones, you know, that little dot on your GPS that tells you where you are. If you don't know where you are, you never are going to be able to plan your journey. And so that's why I'm so thankful for the partnership that builds these incredible kind of tools that are going to help us really clearly understand how we need to align resources to get to where we need to go on behalf of our students. So Governor, thank you for having me here today, and RFA, thank you so much for all your hard work. One of the things that is going to be a top priority for my budget this year is around increasing um, our student outcomes in math. Um, we have seen some really encouraging project, progress this year um, on our literacy scores. We still have a long way to go. About 54% of our students are reading at or above grade level, but only about 41% of our students are at or above grade level in math. And so that's going to be a high priority that you'll see in my budget this year. I'll just say, you know, we, we need to keep increasing our teacher pay. We, we have to have the very best. And we've set a goal of at least 50,000 minimum for starting pay, I think in the next two or three years. And I hope we can exceed that. Next. Everybody want to go get on their dashboard and look at this? Yeah, I think we've got another question for you. Um, you mentioned off the top that this is a way to build trust through transparency. I mean, how big of an issue do you think that is with taxpayers and families out there who not trust it? Well, I think trust um, encompasses a lot of different areas. It encompasses um, the financial um, inputs into our system. It encompasses the curricular materials in our schools. Um, so there are a lot of components to trust, but I know that um, sunshine is always the best disinfectant. And um, as I've shared often with the educators that I've been privileged to talk to, when we have nothing to hide, we can put it all out on the table. Um, and so this is really, again, about creating a conversation about how we take an honest assessment, an honest look of where we are, and then work together to move forward. How often is this dashboard going to be updated? Um, we will have maintenance probably once a year. I don't want to be, maybe I don't want to be recorded. Um, <laughs> no, thank, we will have maintenance about once a year, uh, but also we will get updates. Uh, from the districts and then it depends on the feedback we get. I mean once the the governor and the state superintendent and the general assembly Determine what other features we need, you know, we'll react to that. So at least annually, but but it, it's just a, it's a uh, Customer driven model. What is it you need to see? Can we get the data? And so um, we've got some ideas But it depends on the feed, feedback and the questions we receive Yes, yes, that was a proviso, yes. And so this would have to be, proviso essentially have to be renewed every year for this dashboard to exist? Or is no, sir, we're, we've got started, uh, the proviso was put in, we started it um, until they tell us to stop, we're going to continue with it. Going off that, I mean, how big of an undertaking was creating the dashboard? Um, well, while, while we're getting a lot of credit, um, the credit goes to the 81 or 80 some school districts for getting the data, the Department of Education, we did not want to create additional data. And so we tried to use existing resources. Um, uh, we've been using our staff uh, to enhance, but uh, I think the challenge is as we go forward, this is a pretty heavy lift for this first step. But if you can imagine in about five years from now, when we've got five more years worth of data, and if there's more information on teachers and district level information, it's gonna be a much heavier lift going down the road. What a great question, and that again is why I have been so encouraged by what I have seen in the Title I schools that I've recently visited. Um, each of these schools have had poverty levels well above the state average, some almost as high as 80%, but that secret sauce of success that I shared, an awesome principal leader, high quality instructional materials, and high quality professional development for teachers. And I might add too that these principals are very instructionally focused and they are using data in order to coach their 
teachers um, and to illustrate where students are struggling so that teachers can intervene then in real time. So again, it's just one more example of making data meaningful. And I want to be really clear, poverty is a challenge, it is not an excuse. We see children from every background who are capable, who are thriving, who are learning when the adults in the system align the resources in order to support them. Okay, thank you very much.